is beautiful. In fact, if you consider Old Testament narrative, it's one of the prettier, more beautiful stories in the Old Testament. However, when you read the story through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the story becomes electrifying. One of the things I want you at this church to know every time you come to church and every time you read your Bible, something that's really important is that you know that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, what, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? That God sent his only begotten son, pure and spotless. He lived a perfect life and then he died and rose again so that God could save everyone who would simply believe on his sacrifice, believe on what he did. Something you need to know about the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ is that it is more than a story. It is actually charged spiritual structure. It's a molecular structure. It's a thing that when you hear the gospel preached, it is not just words and narrative and story. The power of God himself is lodged within the gospel. Okay. Jesus said, the words that I say to you, they are spirit and they are life. The building blocks of life, the molecules of life itself are within the gospel. So even if you've been a Christian for 50 years, you still need to have the gospel preached to you. It's not just like, you know, reading a book that you've read before 10 times. It's not recounting something familiar. There's actual spiritual charge, spiritual power inside the message. And another beautiful thing about it is God in his sovereignty took the thread of Jesus Christ before the Old Testament was written, before Abraham was. God took the thread of Jesus Christ and knitted into the fabric of the Old Testament the story of Jesus Christ, even though he wasn't on the scene yet. Okay. So when you read the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is everywhere in the Old Testament. You just have to know how to look. And God did this by, it's not that they're made up characters or fables. God did this by using real historical characters and the issues and circumstances of their lives. And God ordered their steps and ordained their lives in such a way that the circumstances of their lives and sometimes they themselves would be a picture, would be a, an arrow pointing to the Jesus that was coming. So as we step into this story, if we separate ourselves from the narrative itself and we look at the shadows and types, uh, Old Testament examples and representations of Jesus and the gospel, we see some amazing things. For instance, David in the story is a type of God the Father. Okay? David is the king. God our Father is the king. And David has decided to extend kindness, to show kindness to a broken man only because of the name he's connected to. That's the gospel, first layer, that the king would show kindness to you and I only because of the name that we are connected to. It wasn't Mephibosheth's name that got him saved and delivered. It was the fact that Mephibosheth was connected to Jonathan that got him saved and delivered. Mephibosheth himself serves as a type of broken humanity because you look good and you smell good this morning, but we're all broken in some area. I ain't going to tell you where I'm broken. Don't tell me where you are. We'll both make it look good. But in, in some area, we're all 
broken in some way. We're all like the clothes that you they used to sell at Solo Serve. It, it looks good at first glance, but if you start to inspect it, there's just a little something wrong with it, a thread somewhere or a button out of place or a cuff two inches higher than the other one. Just a little something wrong with it. We're all damaged goods in some way. And, and Mephibosheth was saved not by his personal effort or his works. He was saved because a covenant was remembered by another. David and Jonathan had made a covenant. David and Jonathan had the relationship. David and Jonathan, that was the acceptable covenant. And, and David has remembered he has remembered a covenant that's very old. And then finally, Jonathan in the story is a type of Christ. Jonathan was the rightful heir to the kingdom. He was the rightful son that should have been exalted. But he died an untimely and sacrificial death. Yet, even after he died, his name still had the power to save the one that belonged to him. Mephibosheth was saved in the name of Jonathan. And ladies and gentlemen, these layers stack up to be the fullness of the gospel story. God saved us. The king saved us, not because we deserved it, but because we believed on the name of Jesus. Just like Mephibosheth was saved in the name of Jonathan, you and I have been saved and had our sins forgiven in the name of Jesus. Now, let's, let's pivot there that we understand that. We have the lens for it and the paradigm for it. Let's pivot. Deliverance. That's what happened to Mephibosheth. He, he was delivered. He was picked up and taken out of one place and brought into another. Deliverance is a challenging concept to bring to the church because most people, when they think of deliverance, they'll either think one of two things, salvation, which that's fine. And they'll also think of the removal of demonic oppression or possession. And so, and there are many times in our lives and in our walks where we need deliverance. We, even if it's not from uh, demonic possession or oppression, maybe there's habits or cycles or patterns that we're walking in that we need to be broken out of. And, and you got to understand when you need deliverance, deliverance is not something you can give yourself. I'm going to say that again. When you need deliverance, deliverance is, is not something you can give yourself. And, and, and I want to warn you, when, when you listen to people testify, there's a reason God established certain voices to speak over your life and tell you what things are. Because if you listen to a whole bunch of church people testify, they will mess up your circumstances. They'll mess up your story. They'll mess up your thinking. There's, there's these people that, that have struggled with something for 30 or 40 years, and they come down to one altar call. They've shed a few tears and cry and scream and turn around three times. And then they get up and they say they've been delivered and they never struggle again. I, I'm not saying they're lying. I'm not saying that doesn't occasionally happen. That's right, sir. But most of the time, ladies and gentlemen, that's not what deliverance looks like. Okay. In fact, I'm scared of people that don't have a struggle. We all struggle. We just struggle with different things. The scripture gives us two categories of sin. One is no better than the other. One is no lesser than the other. Okay. Uh, sin, the wages of all sin is death, the scripture says. But there's two categories of sin. First, the filthiness of the flesh. Uh, what do I mean by filthiness of the flesh? The filthiness of the body. Okay. These are nasty things you do with your body. Immorality perversion, addiction, things that you do that are a sin with your physical body. And then there is filthiness of the spirit. This is internal in the soul and the spirit. These are sins that you don't do physically on the outside, but, but spiritually 
on the inside. Now, I want you to notice of the seven sins that God said he hated the most, doesn't mean they're punished differently. He just said, of these seven sins, these are the ones I hate the most. Greed, our rage, greed, sloth, that means lazy, pride, lust, envy, and gluttony. I'm not going to preach about gluttony. Y'all all leave and never come back. But <laughs> rage, greed, sloth, pride, lust, envy, gluttony. Seven sins he hates the most. Notice only two of the five are sins of the flesh. Lust and gluttony. Two of the five. That means far more does, does God weigh and get detested by the sins of the spirit than he does the sin of the flesh, like it or not. Proverbs 26, 22 through 25, I was going to read it, but I'm going to stay on my pace. It says all these seven sins, they're called abominations, all these seven sins flow out of the heart of a gossip. That means if you are a gossip, then you've got all seven of these things God hates the most resident in your heart. Now, we preach a lot about immorality, right? If you grew up in church, you heard lots of messages about sins of the flesh. When was the last time you heard a sermon series on gossip? When by deductive reasoning, if I am a gossip, I've got the seven things my God hates the most active in my heart. That's interesting. The filthiness of the flesh is obvious. It's overt. If you're a freak, you can't hide that you're a freak. It's in the way you walk. You know, if you're promiscuous, it, we can tell by the way you walk, by the way you talk, by the way you stand. I was going to give you an example, but I'm not. You know, if you're a glutton, it's obvious. You overindulge. can be food or anything else that you overindulge in. You're glutton. And if you are, it's obvious. If you're an addict, it's show on your face, you know. All that kind of stuff that you do, it starts to show on your face. Filthiness of the flesh is obvious. Filthiness of the spirit, you can hide in church all your life. Because it grows like mold in a dark corner. And the, the truth of the matter is, in my opinion, the best Christians are the ones that have struggled with filthiness of the flesh. I would much rather deal with trying to help people overcome filthiness of the flesh because filthiness of the spirit is so subtle, you don't even know you need to repent from it. You're walking around full of a sin that God detests that you don't even recognize because you just think it's your personality. And so deliverance, back to it, is misunderstood because whether your problem is sins of the flesh or sins of the spirit, either one, let me talk about demonology for one moment, you, you have to open up a door for demonic oppression to enter your life. Okay. The devil can't just send demons to jump on you. You have to open a door. So there's certain movies that have vibrations and signals that carry demon spirits into your home, into your atmosphere. There's certain things you can listen to. There's certain things you can entertain. There's certain things you can read. You may feel like it's harmless, but if you're watching, I don't care if, who produced it. If you're watching movies about witches and warlocks, and if you're watching movies about uh, evil spirits and dark 
um, horror, stuff like that, you're, you're opening up a door and, and some stuff's going to start happening. You, you will see a manifestation in your house. Uh, it just is what it is. Other times, demons attach themselves to the railway, to the frequency of your repetitive sin. Okay, so there may be, and sin is not a demon, and a demon is not sin, but sometimes they join in together, okay? So if you're running on the railway of a habit, of a certain thing, or you're running on the railway of an anger problem, or you're running on the railway of uh, selfishness or pride or whatever it is, when that is not broken, Sometimes evil spirits can attach to that railway you've already built. And in those cases, you do need deliverance. You do need that thing to be cast either out of you or off of you. And that's scriptural and that's biblical. The problem is you can cast the devil out in a minute, but you can't cast out your sin nature. Your sin nature is going to be with you until you die. So some of you really don't need deliverance as much as you need discipline. Because you never learned how to tell the flesh no. And so you get confused when you come to church and you come to the altar for deliverance and you are prayed for and you feel like you got a breakthrough, but then you go back to the same thing and you think in your mind, I guess the deliverance didn't really work. No, it did. We got rid of the devil, but you still don't have no discipline. And I don't care whose altar call you go to. Nobody can give you an impartation of discipline. I cannot, I can lay my hand on you and bless you. I cannot lay my hands on you and make you disciplined. I can lay my hands on you and pray and anoint you with oil, but I cannot make you control what you put into your mouth. I can, I can lay and travail and do all of these things, but I cannot control what you do in your idle time. And so at some point, the conversation gets convoluted because we think we're dealing with an area of deliverance when we really need to be embracing discipline. At some point, every believer has to grow up and become a disciple. There's a difference in a believer and a disciple. Jesus said, if any one of you be my believers, let him take up his cross and follow me. He didn't say that. He said, if any one of you be my disciples, let him take up his cross and follow me. Discipleship is when the believer grows up. Discipleship is when the believer stops playing games. Discipleship is what Paul said when he said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I matured, when I grew up, I put away childish things. And I want to tell some of you that are believing for a new season and believing for a blessing and believing for a turnaround, that door that you are knocking on, it has an entry fee. And the entry fee is you got to put some stuff away. God will not allow you to carry into a new season the same childish behaviors that you've been living with for the last 20 years. At some point, you have to become a disciple. Push somebody, say, put it away, put it away, put it away. Put it away. Your blessing is waiting for you, but put it away. Your miracle's waiting for you, but put it away. For your children's sake, put it away. For your grandchildren's sake, put it away. For God's sake, for your sake, put it away. You know what you need to stop messing with. You know what you need to stop doing. You know what you need to stop playing with. You know what doors you've left open. You know God's convicted you. The preacher preached to you. You read the word. You know. Put it Saul was a man of God, a prophet even, anointed, walking in his purpose. But because he never learned what to put away in his life, because he never learned how to tell self no, he ended up having the kingdom tore away from him. And his grandson Mephibosheth now is suffering because of what Saul wouldn't put away. If you don't put it away, 
I wonder what it'll do to your daughter. If you don't put it away, I wonder what it'll do to your son or your grandson. Those, those family mistakes and sins and patterns, if they're not broken, they continue. And Mephibosheth is suffering now because of what Saul would not deal with then. And the scripture says, David, the king, decided. He's, one day he just decided. 2 Samuel 9, 1, David said, is there anyone? This, this graceful thought just came up out of him. Is there anyone? who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Ziba, the last living servant of Saul's house, said, yeah, there, there is one. There's a son named Mephibosheth. And by grace, the king decided to save him. And the king was thinking about him when he wasn't even thinking about the king. The layers of the gospel keep piling on. Mephibosheth is in a totally different location, in a totally different mindset, doing God knows what with his lame self. And all the way in the palace on the throne, there's a king thinking about him. The gospel continues because it's not that you came to God or found God. It's that when you weren't even thinking about God, God was mindful of you, loved you, and started drawing you to himself. The parallels in the story are amazing. So the king says to Ziba, the servant, he says, I want you to go and I want you to get him out of there. I want you to get him out of there. Yeah, I want you to get him out of there. That's deliverance. I want you to just go get him out of there. That's deliverance. Just go and get him out of there and bring him to me. That's, that's deliverance. And Ziba brings up two problems. He says, number one, your majesty, he's in Lodabar. Lodabar in the scripture is the place of no communication. No messages went into Lodabar. No messages came out. It was a place where communication was impossible. And that speaks to me because when things get really broken in our lives, it's really, really hard to talk about it. Even with a therapist, there's stuff you hold back. Even with your husband or your wife or your parents there's, or your sister, there, you don't give it all. Because when the cut is that deep, when you're that broken, communications, it, it stalls, it gets stuck. Some people, they, they write better than they can speak. And it's not a matter of education. It's a matter of hurt. Because you've, when you've been hurt that bad, it does something to your ability to communicate and to vocalize how you were feeling. And, and Mephibosheth is hurt bad, and he's in a place where he can't communicate. Have you ever been in a place where you just couldn't talk about it? Have you ever been in a place where you felt like if you ever told anybody the whole story, everybody would back away from you? Have you ever been in a dark cave in loaded bar where communication was shut down and all your interactions with people were fake. You'd smile at people when you walked into work and you'd, you'd make small talk with people when you saw them in the hallway. But the truth of the matter is you hadn't really talked, not from the deepest part of you, in 15 years since that thing happened that night because you are living in a place of no communication. That's the first problem. Second problem, Ziba says, and your majesty, he's lame in both his feet. Translation, your majesty, I want you to understand something. You take him on, you're taking on a project. You're taking on a, a project. You know what I found out? You know nobody likes taking on a project person. 
It's like there's been a change in the world over the last few years. People just will not tolerate the idea of taking on a project. Everybody wants everybody that's interacting with them to be at least mostly whole. It's like we, we, we wear a sign around our necks, no broken people here. And it's hypocritical of us because every single one of us is broken ourselves in some way. Every single one of us, we're a project in some way. And I started, I started throwing shade at Ziba for this comment because the king asked for him. The king didn't ask the details. He asked for the man. Why do, always, why do people always focus on the details more than they focus on the person? We don't want folks focusing on our details. Y'all real quiet but I know it's true. You don't want a private eye going through the long sorted history of all your personal details, but we do it to people. Zyab was doing that. I want you to know he's in Lodabar and he's lame. In other words, you take him on, you're going to have to feed him for the rest of your life or his life. You're going to have to house him. You're going to have to provide for him. You're going to have to set something up and he's going to be a headache. He's going to be a project as long as he lives. He's never getting better. He's lame in both of his feet. This problem's never getting solved. You're going to be stuck with it. Another layer of the gospel because David said, go get him anyway. He counted up the cost, what it would cost to save him, what it would cost to deliver him, what it would cost to provide for him. And he factored in the fact that he was never going to get any better than he was at his lowest moment. And he still chose to give him the grace. And when I look at that, I see God and I see me. Because when I came to God, I came broken. I came lame. I came offering nothing. I came with no benefit. Fits. I came knowing that he would have to care for me constantly. He'd have to keep picking me up. I keep making the same mistakes. And in some ways, I'm still not totally fixed. In some ways, I'm still broken. And he counted the cost and still said, go get him. Go get him. I want him. He's a lifetime project. I know. I'm signing up for a lifetime project. You got to see this is the gospel. Not that most people misunderstand the gospel. They think you accept Jesus Christ and then you climb this ladder of morality to become a good person and a Christian and God blesses you and accepts you. That is not the gospel. The gospel is when you were at your worst is when you were loved the most by God. <laughs> no matter what you do, you can't be more loved. No matter what you do, you can't be less loved. God loved you with an everlasting, immeasurable love beyond searching, Paul says. And he said, I, I want him. I, I want you to go get him. And so, and so the amazing thing is, Ziba goes down to Lodabar. He had to go there in person. He couldn't send a messenger. He couldn't send a convoy. He, he goes to Lodabar. And in my mind, I see Mephibosheth pining away. Just another day in my misery. Lame in my feet, separated from my inheritance, forgotten and broken. Just pining away. And when the sun came up that morning, Another day of my depression, another day of my anxiety, another day of my pain, another day of boredom where my mind is not stimulated, another day of no challenges for me where I don't have to embrace anything or chase anything, just another day. And while he's thinking that, a knock comes on the door and he said, who is it? I can't get up, you know, who is it? He said, it's Ziba. What do you want? The king wants you to come. To his house. Does he know I'm broken? 
Does he know I'm bitter? Does he know I'm a project? Does he know I'm as good as a dead dog? And while Mephibosheth is giving all the reasons that he can't be saved, Ziba just walks over and picks him up and carries his tail out of that place to the king. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what deliverance is. That's what deliverance is. It's not getting better and getting strong enough to get up. No, deliverance is when God just picks you up out of your mess and carries you to a different place. The old folks used to sing, he picked me up and turned me around. That's why they said it. That's what salvation is. With no effort of your own, God just comes in picks you up. You wouldn't have got saved if you had anything to do with it. You got saved because God came by and just picked you up and took you out. I got to stop and thank him for all the times he picked me up when I couldn't get up, when I wouldn't get up, when I wanted to stay in the mess. God came in and just picked me. Has he ever picked you up? Has he ever picked you up? Then you owe him a praise. Whatever your level, whatever your station, whatever your stage, if he ever picked you up, take your mind back there and give him a praise for it. Pick me up. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He picked me up. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, he did. Yes, he, he picked me up. I don't know when the last time, most of you grown, but I don't know when the last time somebody just picked you up was. Probably since you was a kid. You've been picked up in the last month or two by somebody, you know, just picked all the way up. So then your mind is quite distant from the facts that it entails. When you get picked up by somebody that's strong enough to pick your tail up, there ain't nothing you can do about If I decide to go and pick one of my two sons up, there ain't nothing they can do. Daddy's just going to pick you up. <sighs> that is the gospel of Jesus Christ that when you believe that he lived perfectly died completely rose bodily and you confess with your mouth that you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord regardless of where you are laying regardless of where your circumstances have led you regardless of what's going on in your mind filthiness of the flesh or the spirit God comes and he just, he just picks picked him up and brings him to the king. Take me to the king. Just brings him to the king. He has been delivered. Problem is, still damaged. Taking him out of where he was, changing his life, restoring his inheritance. None of that did anything for the damage. Some of you don't feel like you've been delivered because you're confusing the deliverance with the damage. The king did his part. And the deliverance took, it worked. He was in a different place. Still, he's still, he's still damaged goods. And I started wondering, why do we hate damage so much since we all are it on some level? Why do we resist damage so much? No damaged goods here. I want no damaged goods in my church. I don't want no damaged goods in my house. I don't want no damaged goods in my life. I don't know what, want no damaged goods to be friends with my kids. I don't want no damaged goods. As 
What's wrong with damage? You know, I found out that damaged people praise God differently. I found out when you're really damaged and you know it, you worship the Lord from your heart in a different way and with a different sound and on a different frequency than people who think that they've got it all together do. It, 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 when you're damaged, there, there, there's a beauty in it because you never come into God proud and arrogant. You always come humble because you know if it wasn't for the grace and the mercy and the kindness of God, you would have never made it out of the cave you were in. And, and you're still leaning on God because you're not all the way fixed yet. You still got something lame in you, something wrong with you, and, and you need the Lord. If I can't hold on to you, I won't be able to move. I, I can't walk without you. I can't move without you. And, and being damaged keeps it ever so present. It sears on the mind how much I need you. I need thee. Oh, I need thee every hour. Every hour I I need damaged people extend a grace to others. Yeah. What you don't understand, those of you that are so hesitant to give people grace, is grace received must become grace given. It's a beautiful message, boy. Don't get apostolic. Always let a warning flash in front of your eyes when you're dealing with people who refuse to give others grace when you know they themselves have received it. There is something sinister that slithers through the body of Christ that we would receive great grace for gross sins. And once we have received the grace and been blessed to come up a few levels, all of a sudden we forget and get amnesia about how filthy we were when God gave us the grace. And all of a sudden someone comes by that needs grace for their filthiness, that needs grace for their natural that needs grace for their mistakes and all of a sudden we put the brakes whoa 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 so good. who put the brakes on you far as I know every one of you in here been loved and accepted by this church and our leadership as far as I know every one of you has been preached a gospel of grace by your pastor as far as I know every one of you has seen the gospel of grace demonstrated in this church in this community and in your lives why won't you give what you've received Bring him here. Come here. Sit down. I got a chair for you. And instead of sitting down, Mephibosheth gets on the floor. Scripture says he prostrated himself. He means get down. Floor. He's so blessed, he's scared. I don't know if God's ever been so good to you that it's that it scared you. He's on the floor. And David said, I, I got you out of there. You ain't ever going back there. Uh, I got a place for you. I've got a place for you. Little did he know all while he was suffering in his dark cave. God was preparing a place for him. And those of you that are broken, those of you that are lame, I came to tell you, while you've been crying and suffering, while you've been hurting and, and licking your wounds, God has been preparing a place for you. He'd been preparing a place. For, but, 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 but the challenge is, when you try to talk to damaged people about divine places, they go negative. David said, I got a place for you. Mephibosheth says, 
Why would you want to help a dead dog? He's on the floor. Why is he on the floor in the palace when there's a chair? Because he's used to the floor. He lived on the floor all his life. So, so there's a prepared place, a seat at the king's table, a seat in the government, a seat of authority, a seat of influence. And then there's the floor. And this is the only thing the king can't do for him and the king can't do for you. He can't make you decide to get yourself up off of the floor. If you got to crawl up, if you got, if you got to use your arms and pull up, however you have to, you have got to get up off the floor. And the Holy Spirit told me the reason some of you have been attacked so fiercely in this season by the enemy is the enemy senses that through the word and the ministry, you're starting to get up and the enemy's trying to attack you and sow lies and discord and sow all kind of pain and misery into your mind to try to keep you from getting up but I came to declare there is a lifting in this house there is a lifting in this region there is a lifting in this zip code there is a lifting on this address and there's a lifting on your address you are rising not falling getting higher not going lower you are being raised up and the gospel continues because I never understood what Paul meant when he said we are raised up to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just like Mephibosheth, he had to be raised up to sit at the king's table in the place of the palace. But he had to get up challenge what's what's the challenge with getting up what's the challenge with getting up the, the Bible says in Saul's decline Mephibosheth's granddaddy in his decline that there was a coup and soldiers rushed the palace so baby Mephibosheth he had a nurse and when the nurse heard the sound of the soldiers she grabbed him out of his crib and she began to flee and she was a clumsy nurse and she dropped him and shattered his feet shattered his angles and his shins. So he would have been just fine. But somebody dropped him. So many people in this room, you would have been fine. But you, when you were little. Or when you were vulnerable. Somebody else. dropped you. You ever want to explain it to people? I mean, you don't, but you have the instinct. I'm sorry. I'm like this. I was dropped. I wonder who dropped you. And you survived it. He survived it. Mephibosheth survived it. But it impacted his development. How did your drop impact yours? Maybe you're not learning disabled. Maybe you just couldn't get it out because of the anxiety as a result of the fact that you were. Maybe you're not ugly. Maybe you just deeply think you are because somebody else dropped you. Maybe you're not unapproachable and maybe you're not that person that just don't like people. 
Maybe it's just because... Charlotte. You gotta be careful who holds the vulnerable. You know, your spirit, your soul, your insides. You may be older now, but they're still, they're still fragile. You gotta be careful who ministers to a fragile soul. The ministry is powerful and it can build you up. It can also tear you all the way down. You gotta be careful who you let hold the vulnerable. I brought you here to give you this seat. Look at me. This seat, your seat. You sit at my table continually. You can't do nothing to get out of this seat. You can't disappoint big enough to get out of this seat. This is your seat. And... I'm going to take all the land your granddaddy had and I'm going to count up the value of it and all the land your daddy had and I'm going to count up the value of it and I'm going to give you in a day what it took them two lifetimes to acquire because God watches while you suffer. God watches while you get taken advantage of. God watches when people steal things from you. God watches what you had to go through because of the ways that you were dropped. God knew that if it wouldn't have been for that person doing that thing, you wouldn't have been lame in that area and God kept notes and so he, he said not only is this your home is this your place is this your seat is this your influence but I added up all the money you're owed and I'm gonna give you back pay for what you suffered God sent me here to tell somebody he's been taking notes on your losses bottling your tears he knows and he understands and back pay is but but that's not even the most beautiful part of the story because wealth and health and prosperity, it's in the gospel, but it's never the best part. The most beautiful part of the story is that he never gets healed. He kept that condition all of his life, even in a king's house. And in spite of his condition, he always had a seat at the table. Listen, listen, listen. There's two things you got to know when you're taking the gospel into your heart. Because dangerous men with microphones that call themselves ministers will drop you with this one. There is a profound difference and a clear and didactic dividing line between your position and your condition. When Christ saved you, what he changed in a moment, what he delivered in an instant, what he revolutionized over your life is your position. We have gone from the quiet caves of Lodabar to being seated with heaven, in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We have gone there positionally. Positionally. Our conditions change. Sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes level to the ground. But on your best day or your worst day, your position is fixed in him. It's like the story of the prodigal son. Yes, Lawrence. It's like the story of the prodigal son. On the day he woke up and went to his father, before he asked his father for the inheritance, he was his father's son. That's his position. 
after he asked his father for his inheritance, he was his father's son. When he left the house and went to a far country, he was his father's son. When he spent all he had on riotous living and prostitutes, he's still his father's son. And when he came back on that day, the father ran to him. Why? Because he never stopped being his son. That was his position. Now, his conditions, they went up and down. They went crazy. They ran the gambit. But his position never changed. What's so beautiful about deliverance and salvation is because faith in the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on Calvary is so powerful and efficacious that the scripture says in Romans 10, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus in faith shall be saved, shall be delivered. But that's why deliverance has tenses. First Corinthians talks about God has delivered. Then Paul says God does deliver. Then he says he shall deliver. That every single one of us have been positionally changed. The only thing in Mephibosheth's story that changed was his position. Every single one of us in some way, shape, or form are still dealing with the conditions in our lives. But if you believe in Jesus, if you look at the cross and you look at his death, his burial and his resurrection and you say in your heart, my God, I believe that and you confess with your mouth, my God, I believe that then your position changes instantly and you become a child of God and a joint heir with Christ. Like Mephibosheth was a joint heir with Jonathan and Saul and got all of the inheritance just because of his position. You become a joint heir in Christ Jesus. And it may it may never get better. We'll pray it will. We'll lay hands on it. We'll believe in God. I can't work miracles. I can just pray for them. And we will see many. I've seen many. But for some, to give you a truth, it may not change. From Mephibosheth, it never changed. But you know what? Every king's table has a tablecloth. And what was broken about him was always covered by the king. And whatever is broken about you will always be covered by the king. You've been raised up with Christ Jesus to sit. He didn't say to stand, to sit in heavenly places. And in your seated posture, you will always be covered by the king. A king that'll let you sit there even though you don't deserve to. A king that'll let you eat your fill. A king that'll bless you and restore you and strengthen you. But, but most of all, a king that just keeps you covered. Last thing I want to tell you, your God has you covered. Wherever you're broken, wherever you're lame, wherever you're hurting, whatever's going on, your God has you covered. Stand up and give him some praise and worship in the house. I want all the broken people to worship him. I want all the people that still got something under the covers of the king to, to give him thanks and praise. Nothing's wrong. I'm just giving somebody a minute to thank their father for all of the things he's got covered.
Take your seat at the table. It's your position. Take your authority. Take your influence. Take your name back. Take your rights back. I confess with my mouth if you want to if you want if you feel to I confess with my mouth what I have believed in my heart that Jesus is Lord that he died on the cross by the power of the Father he was raised to life on the third day. I received Jesus and I declare Jesus is my God, my Savior, my Redeemer, and my covering in Jesus' name. Give him a praise.